The ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict was further complicated this week by a mysterious fainting epidemic occurring among young women, primarily Palestinian girls, but some Israeli women soldiers too, in the West Bank. Most sources have since agreed that the case was one of mass hysteria, though accusations were made at the time and ever since that there was some kind of poisoning or gassing on the part of Israel to drive the Arabs from the West Bank or the Palestinians to make Israel look bad and incite riots. Over in the US, Ronald Reagan proposed his Strategic Defense Initiative program for satellite-based missile interception system. Reagan, a lifelong critic of the principle of mutually assured destruction, described it as a system to make nuclear weapons obsolete, but critics worried it might make a nuclear war more likely by making it feel winnable. And the Motown record label celebrated its 25th anniversary with a TV special, including reunions for The Supremes, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, and The Jackson 5. Marvin Gaye spoke on the history of black music and played his 1971 classic What's Going On, while Michael Jackson performed hits from his current best-selling album Thriller, including the current Billboard number 1, Billie Jean, in which he performed his famous Moonwalk for the first time. In California, as the Formula One teams arrived at Long Beach and began setting up shop, there were rumours that this would be the last time they would do so. This was the eighth running of the United States Grand Prix West, but it was becoming increasingly expensive to run. The organisers not only had to pay to stage the race, but also pay the fees to air freight all the teams in from the previous race and out again. Focus fees had increased, and while the race usually attracted a fair crowd, it was becoming less profitable. The organisers of the Kart IndyCar series had approached headman Chris Pook, who was said to be seriously considering their offer. To try and minimise disruption, the former pit straight along Ocean Boulevard had been moved to a parallel road and the pits moved to the curving shoreline drive section, among other amendments. Notably, with the pit lane now on a curve, the exit was controlled by a marshal with a stoplight, which meant that teams would be very keen to try and avoid making a stop if they could. There were the usual problems with the surface too, with drivers finding a particularly bad double bump where the new section met Seaside Way, both with different cambers. Drivers reported having to either lift to avoid takeoff or land heavily and have to then suddenly break for a sharp right hand turn. All were concerned about the effects on the suspension, especially when Derek Warwick's broke and the Tolman team packed up and missed the rest of Friday qualifying while they worked on the cars. As if the F1 press didn't have enough to talk about during Friday's sessions, Alan Jones was back. As rumoured, he was driving the Arrows in place of Chico Serra, in the hope of putting himself in the shop window and gaining some sponsorship to race full-time, hopefully in a better car. Interest had at least been sufficient to get some temporary Valvoline sponsorship on the Arrows, which was something at least. There were some slight concerns about his fitness, though. He'd broken a hip a couple of months earlier, falling off a horse on his farm. Renault, meanwhile, had flown one of the new RE40 chassis out for Alain Prost, so concerned about their poor performance in Brazil that they felt unable to wait until the next race in France where they had intended to launch it. Overnight, the organisers poured quick-drying cement in between those two bumps, making them into one big bump, which was a little better at least. Motorbike man Johnny Chicotto pronounced it fun, and most drivers improved their times. René Arnoux had been top of the Friday times after taking the bumps flat out, and he only lost one place on Saturday despite not improving his time. The beneficiary was his teammate, Patrick Tombe, taking his first career pole position. In fact, it was quickly obvious that tyres mattered most of all here. Next up were the Williams twins, like the Ferraris on Goodyear's, then De Angelis and Warwick both on Pirelli's, and then Alboreto, Goodyear, before the first Michelin runners, Prost in 8th and Jarier in 10th. Of the Michelin shod runners, the Brabham's were 11th and 20th, the McLaren's 22nd and 23rd, while another Michelin team, Ozella, filled both of the non-qualifying spots. With the Goodyear bosses no doubt delighted by their tyres' performance on home soil, cars lined up for the start under blue skies and a gentle sea breeze. The lights went green, and Tombe was a little tardy getting away, while Rosberg behind him fishtailed wildly through the gap, banging wheels with Arnoux, which allowed Tombe to recover and take the lead, with Rosberg and Lafitte now splitting the two Ferraris. Behind them were the two green Tyrrells and Patrese's Brabham. Partway round the lap, Rosberg shaped up to have a go at Tombe, but lost the back end and pulled a full 360 before continuing, having lost second to Lafitte. Alboreto, meanwhile, squeezed past Arnoux rather forcefully, and Patrese got ahead of Sullivan. Lafitte let Rosberg bat through, so the order was Tombe, now pulling out a lead thanks to Rosberg's pirouette, Rosberg, Lafitte, Alboreto, Arnoux, Patrese, Sullivan, Prost and Cheever. Arnoux was keen to get back ahead of Alboreto, but the Italian was making his Tyrrell as wide as he could, while Rosberg was closing up with Tombe once more, the gap at just two seconds after five laps, and Sullivan had fallen behind the two Renaults and Jarier. 
Soon enough, Rosberg was on Tom Bay's tail, but perhaps chastened by his earlier spin, seemed content to await his chance for the moment, and the top six continued running close together, less than five seconds across the group, with the Renaults running in tandem a couple of seconds behind them. Warwick had dropped back into midfield and spun out of contention on lap 12, while Arnoux dropped away, his steering having been knocked off kilter by his start line wheel banging. Cheever came past into fifth, while Prost had also dropped back with a recurrence of the misfire that had been niggling all weekend. He came in on lap 16 to have it looked at. A few laps later, Cheever peeled in for new tyres, only to find Prost still there, and he had to go straight through. Prost lost three laps in the process, and Cheever had dropped back to boot. Rosberg provided another hairy moment when he had to go at Tombe, but outbraked himself into the chicane going on to shoreline drive, giving Tombe a bit of breathing room and dropping himself back into the clutches of Lafitte. He soon recovered, though, while Lafitte still had Alboreto and Patrese climbing all over the back of him, and Jarier had now motored up to the back of the group too. The Ligier soon carved past Patrese and started shaping up to have a look at Alboreto. He got by, but only by sending them both into the runoff area and letting Patrese back through. The Tyrrell had been damaged and Alboreto fumed into the pits for repairs. So now it was just the three together at the front, with Rosberg still sticking to Tombe like a sweaty t-shirt and Lafitte close behind. Rosberg wasn't giving Tombe a moment's peace, but the Frenchman calmly closed the door, made his Ferrari as wide as possible and held the lead. The pace was quite conservative and soon enough Patrese and an apparently undamaged Jarier were back up behind Lafitte as Tombe approached the first of the backmarkers, Giacomelli and Mansell. Going into the hairpin on lap 26, Rosberg had another ambitious go. Tombe closed the door and there was contact, tipping the Ferrari up in the air and into a spin. Rosberg went round the outside and, while the camera was still trained on Tombe to see if he'd get it going again, the two Williamses touched and Jarier collided with the back of Rosberg, pushing the fin into the wall and deranging his own front wing. So, suddenly, Lafitte was on his own in the lead, with Tombe, Rosberg and Jarier all out of the running. Patrese was second, with Sullivan and Sierra following, but coming up quickly behind were the two McLarens of Lauda and Watson, who swiftly moved past into third and fourth places, with Sierra also getting past Sullivan. From 22nd and 23rd on the grid, the McLarens had fairly motored through the field in formation, and were now about 20 seconds behind the leading pair, with Watson getting past Lauda to go up to third. Behind them, Johnny Chicotto was also driving a barnstorming second race, and had made it up to fifth behind the two McLarens in his Theodore. It was about half distance by now, and Lafitte led, with Patrese a fairly static one to two seconds behind him, and Watson and Lauda reeling the pair in. By lap 40, Watson was less than 10 seconds behind Lafitte, and the tyres on the Williams were starting to fade. Patrese was right up behind, and, unseen by the camera, he had a go and slid wide, allowing Watson and Lafitte through. Before long, Lafitte had Watson right up under his gearbox, and he didn't stay there long, passing under braking to take the lead. Lauda was passed a couple of corners later, and the McLarens were up into the first two spots. Lafitte, meanwhile, fell back towards Patrese, who had the gap down from 25 seconds on lap 45 to go past on lap 52. Meanwhile, PK retired with the sticking throttle after a pretty anonymous race, and six laps later, Jones pulled into the pits to retire with fatigue, having not driven seriously in a couple of years. With Lauda troubled with leg cramp and on different tyres to Watson, he settled in for second place, and the race seemed set to run uneventfully to the finish, the McLarens leading Patrese, Lafitte, Cheever and Arnoux on lap 60 of 75. Arnoux had started going much better after a tyre change, but had taken some time to catch up with the leaders once more. Soon enough, though, he was behind Cheever, and the pair caught Lafitte, still struggling with his tyres. As Cheever pulled out to pass Lafitte, Arnoux passed them both to go from 6th to 4th in one neat manoeuvre, while Cheever also passed Lafitte. The Williams pit had mistakenly told Lafitte that the pair were unlapping themselves, so he moved over, but it wouldn't have mattered, there was no way he could have kept them behind him for long. Cheever and Arnoux had a great scrap for a couple of laps, which provided some much-needed entertainment, but eventually René made it stick and began to pull away, and Cheever pulled over with gearbox trouble soon afterwards. Just three laps from the end, it was Patrese's turn to coast to a halt, a fault in his distributor arm putting paid to his third place, which was inherited by Arnoux, with Lafitte nursing his Williams home for fourth, Sierra fifth, and Chicotto, the first ever Venezuelan point scorer in just his second Grand Prix, a well-earned reward for a good day's work. Boesel got his first ever finish in 7th, followed by the Tyrrells, who'd kept running. Patrese was classified 10th ahead of Prost and Mansell, the last runners, both three laps down after extended pit stops, and Cheever had gone far enough to be classified 13th. It hadn't been a classic, but John Watson had achieved a truly remarkable feat in winning from 22nd on the grid, a record that stands to this day. 
Lauda was just as happy, adding six points to his four from Brazil to take the lead of the championship ahead of the two race winners so far, and Arnu must have been equally satisfied with a podium finish with damaged steering. With that, the teams packed up and headed for Europe, with the Renault team in particular hoping their fortunes would improve as they prepared for their home race at Paul Ricard. Before that, though, there was a bit of an oddity. The non-championship Race of Champions event at Brands Hatch, just one week before the French Grand Prix, which was set to feature Rosberg, Jones and Piquet among its field. 